Part One, Chapter One of Lillian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Lillian by Arnold Bennett. Part One, Chapter One. The Girl Alone. Lillian, in dark blue office frock with an embroidered red line round the neck and detachable black wristlets that preserved the ends of the sleeves from dust and friction, sat idle at her flat desk in what was called the small room at Felix Griggs' establishment in Clifford Street, off Bond Street. There were three desks, three typewriting machines, and three green-shaded lamps. Only Lillian's lamp was lighted, and she sat alone with darkness above her chestnut hair and about her, and a circle of radiance below. She was twenty-three. Through the drawn blind of the window could just be discerned the backs of the letters of words painted on the glass. Felix Grigg, typewriting office, opened day and night. Seen from the street, the legend stood out black and clear against the faintly glowing blind. It was eleven p.m. That a beautiful young girl, created for pleasure and affection and expensive flattery, should be sitting by herself at eleven p.m. in a gloomy office in Clifford Street, in the centre of the luxurious, pleasure-mad, love-mad West End of London, seemed shocking and contrary to nature, and Lillian certainly so regarded it. She pictured the shut shops, and shops and yet again shops, filled with elegance and costliness. Robes, hats, stockings, shoes, gloves, incredibly fine lingerie, furs, jewels, perfumes— designed and confected for the setting off of just such young attractiveness as hers. She pictured herself rifling those deserted and silent shops by some magic means, and emerging safe, undetected, in batiste so rare that her skin blushed through it, in a frock that was priceless and yet nothing at all, and in warm, marvellous sables that no blast of wind or misfortune could ever penetrate, and diamonds in her hair. She pictured thousands of smart women, with imperious command over rich attendant males, who at that very moment were moving quickly in automobiles from theatres towards the dancing clubs that clustered round Felix Griggs' typewriting office. At that very moment she herself ought to have been dancing, not in a smart club, no, only in the basement of a house where an acquaintance of hers lodged, and only with clerks and things like that, and only to a gramophone, but still a dance, a respite from the immense ennui and solitude called existence. She had been kept late at the office because of Miss Griggs' failure to arrive. Miss Grigg, sister of Felix, was the mainspring of the establishment, which, except financially, belonged much more to her than to Felix. Miss Grigg energised it, organised it, and disciplined it, in addition to loving it. Hers had been the idea— not quite original, but none the less very valuable as an advertisement, of remaining open all night. Clever men would tell simpletons in men's clubs about the typewriting office that was never closed, example of the inexhaustible wonderfulness of a great capital, and would sometimes, with a wink and a single phrase, endow the office with a dubious and exciting reputation. Miss Grigg herself was the chief night-watcher. She exulted in vigils. After attendance in the afternoon, if her health was reasonably good, she would come on duty again at 8 p.m. and go home by an early tube train on the following morning. One of the day staff would remain until 8 p.m. in order to hand over to her. As a recompense, this girl would be let off at 4 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. the next day. Justice reigned, and all the organisation for dealing with rushes of work was inspired by Miss Griggs' own admirable ideas of justice. On this night, Lillian had been appointed to stay till eight o'clock. Eight o'clock, no Miss Grigg. Eight thirty o'clock, no Miss Grigg. Nine, nine thirty, ten o'clock, no Miss Grigg. And now eleven o'clock, and no Miss Grigg. It was unprecedented and dreadfully disturbing. Lillian even foresaw a lonely, horrible night in the office, with nothing but tea, bread and butter, and the living gas stove to comfort her. Agonising prospect. She had spent nights in the office before, but never alone. She felt that she simply could not support the ordeal. Yet, such was the moral, invisible empire of absent Miss Grigg, she dared not shut up the office and depart. The office, naturally, had a telephone, but most absurdly there was no telephone at the Grigg's house. Felix's fault. 
and so Lillian could only speculate upon the explanation of Miss Griggs' absence. She speculated melodramatically. Then her lovely little ear, quickened by apprehension, heard footsteps on the lower stairs. Heavy footsteps, but rapid enough. She flew through the anteroom to the outer door, and fearfully opened it, and gazed downwards to the electric light, that somehow equivocally invited wayfarers to pass through the ever-open street door, and climb the shadowy steps to the second story, and behold their strange matters. A villainous old fellow was hurrying up the echo in stairs. He wore a pea-jacket and a red cotton muffler. A moment ago she had had no thought of personal danger. Now, in an instant, she was petrified with fright. Her face turned from rose to grey. Of course it was a hold-up. Post-offices and box-offices of theatres and even banks had been held up of late. Banks, Felix Rigg had heard, were taking precautions. Felix had suggested that he too ought to take precautions, revolvers, alarm-bells, etc. But Miss Grigg, not approving, had smiled her wise, condescending smile, and nothing had been done. Miss Grigg, thought Lillian, had no imagination. That was what was wrong with her. Miss, growled hoarsely the oncoming bandit, give us a match, will ye? Yes, they always began thus innocently, did robbers. Lillian tried to speak, and could not. She could not even dash within and bang and bolt the door. With certain crises she might possibly be able to deal, but not with this sort of crisis. She was as defenceless as a blossom. She thought passionately that destiny had no right to put her in such a terrible extremity, and that the whole world was to blame. She felt as once women used to feel in the sack of cities, faint with fear, and streaks of thrilled, eager, voluptuous anticipation running through the fear. She reflected that the matches were on the mantelpiece over the gas-stove. The man stood on the landing. He had an odour. He was tall. He would have made four of Lillian. She knew that it was ridiculous to retreat into the office and find the matches demanded. She knew that the matches were only a pretext. She knew that she ought to hit on some brilliant expedient for outwitting the bandit and winning eternal glory in the evening papers. But she retreated into the office to find the matches. He followed heavily behind her. He was within her room. She could not have turned to face him for ropes of great pearls. "'Give us a box, miss. It's a windy night. Two of me lamps is blown up, and I dropped me matches into me tea can. <laughs> and I ain't got no paper to carry a light from me far, and I, I ain't seen a bobby for an hour. No, I ain't, though you wouldn't believe me.' Lillian was suddenly blinded by the truth. The roadway of Clifford Street and part of Bond Street was in the midst of a process of deep excavation. It was acutely up, to the detriment of traffic and trade. And this fellow was the night watchman who sat in a sentry-box by a burning brazier. She recognised him. "'Thank you kindly, miss, and may God bless you. I know ye was open all night. Good night. Hope I didn't frighten ye, miss.' He laughed grimly, roguishly, and honestly. When he was gone, Lillian laughed also, but hysterically. She did not at all want to laugh, but she laughed. Then she dropped into her chair and wept with painful, sobbing violence. And as, regaining calm, she realised the horrors which might have happened to her, the resentment in her heart against destiny and against the whole world grew intense and filled her heart to the exclusion of every other feeling. End of Part 1 Chapter 1「Chapter Two of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part One, Chapter Two, Early Years. Miss Sher, as she was addressed in the office, was the only child of an art master, and until she found the West End, she had lived all her life in a long Putney Road, no house of which could truthfully say that it was in any way better than or different from its neighbours. This street realised the ideal of equality before God. It had been Lillian's prison, from which she was let out for daily exercise, and she hated it as ardently as any captive ever hated a prison. Lionel Cher had had charge over the art side of an enormous polytechnic in another suburb. In youth he had won a national scholarship at South Kensington, and the glory of the scholarship never faded, not even when he was elected President of the Association of Art Masters. He was destined by fate to be a teacher of art, 
and appointed by heaven to be a headmaster and to reach the highest height of artistic pedagogy. He understood organisation, the handling of committees, of undermasters and of pupils, the filling up of forms, the engaging of models, and he understood profoundly the craft of pushing pupils successfully through examinations. His name was a sweet odour in the nostrils of the London County Council. He rehabilitated art and artists in Putney, which admitted that it had quite a wrong notion of art and artists, having hitherto regarded art as unmanly and artists as queer, loose, bankruptcy-bound fellows. Whereas Mr. Sher paid his rent promptly, went to Margate for his long holiday, wore a frock-coat, attended church, and had been mentioned as a suitable candidate for the Putney Borough Council. Until Mr. Sher, Putney had never been able to explain to itself the respectability of the National Gallery, which, after all, was full of art done by artists. The phenomenon of Mr. Sher solved the enigma. The old masters must have been like Lionel Sher. At home, Mr. Sher was a fat man, with a black beard and moustache, who adored his daughter and loved his wife. A strict monogamist, whose life would bear the fullest investigation, he was nevertheless what is euphemistically called euxorious. He returned home of a night, often late on account of evening classes, with ravishment. He knew that his wife and daughter would be ready to receive him, and they were. He kissed and fondled them, he praised them to their faces, asserting that their like could not be discovered among womankind, and he repeated again and again that his little Lillian was very beautiful. He ate and drank a good supper. If he loved his wife, he loved also eating and drinking. Now and then he would arrive with half a bottle of champagne sticking out of his overcoat pocket. Not that he came within a thousand miles of drinking. He did not. He would not even keep champagne or any wine, except Australian Burgundy, in the house. But he would pop in at the wine merchants when the fancy took him. He seldom worried his dears with his professional troubles. Only if organisation and committees were specially exasperating would he refer, and then but casually, to the darker side of existence. As for art, he never mentioned it, save to deride some example of continental, or advanced, or depraved, or perverse art, comprehensively described as futurist, which had regrettably got into the pages of The Studio, the only magazine to which he subscribed. Nor did he ever in his prime paint or sketch for pleasure. But at the beginning of every year he would set to work to do a small thing or two for the Royal Academy, which small or thing or two were often accepted by the Royal Academy, though never, one is sorry to say, sold. The Royal Academy soiree was Lillian's sole outlet into the great world. She could not, however, be as enthusiastic about it as were her father and mother, for in the privacy of her mind she held the women thereat to be a most dowdy and frumpy lot. The girl loved her father and mother. She also pitied her mother and hated her father. She pitied her mother for being an utterly acquiescent slave with no will of her own, and hated her father because he had not her ambition to rise above the state of the frumpy middle middle class, and for other reasons. The man had realised his own ambitions, and was a merry soul sunk in contentment. The world held nothing that he wanted and did not possess. He looked up to the upper classes without envy or jealousy, and read about them with ingenuous joy. He had no instinct for any sort of elegance. Lillian was intensely ambitious, yearning after elegance. She saw illustrated advertisements of furniture in the studio, and of attire in the daily papers, and compared them with the smug ugliness of the domestic interior and her plain frocks, and was passionately sad. She read about the emancipation of girls and about the new girl, and compared this winged creature with herself. Writers in newspapers seemed to assume that all girls were new girls, and Nilia knew the awful falsity of the assumption. She rarely left Putney, unless it was to go by motor-bus to Kew Gardens on a Saturday afternoon with Papa and Mamma. She did not reach the West End once in a thousand years, and when she did, she came back tragic. She would have contrived to reach the West End oftener, but, though full of leisure, she had no money for bus fares. Mr. Sher never gave her money except for a specific purpose, and she could not complain, for her mother, an ageing woman, never had a penny that she must not account for, not a penny, 
never. Mr. Sherr could not conceive what either of them could want with loose money. He was not averse, he admitted, from change and progress. With great breadth of mind he admitted that change and progress were inevitable. But his attitude towards these phenomena resembled that of the young St. Augustine towards another matter, who cried, "'Give me chastity, O Lord, but not yet.' In Mr. Sher's view his wife and daughter had no business in the world, and indeed his finest pride was to maintain them in complete ignorance of the world. Even during the war he dissuaded Lillian from any war work, holding that she could most meekly help the Empire to triumph by helping to solace her father in the terrible troubles of keeping a large art school alive under D.O.R.A. and the Conscription Act. Later Mrs. Sher was struck down by cancer on the liver, and died after six months' illness, which cost Mr. Sher a considerable amount of money, lavishly squandered, cheerfully paid. Mr. Sher was heartbroken. He really grew quite old in a fortnight, and his mute appeal to Lillian for moral succour and the balm of filial tenderness was irresistible. Lillian had lost a mother, but the main fact in the situation was that Mr. Sher had lost a peerless wife. Lillian became housekeeper, and the two settled down together. Mr. Sher adored his daughter more than ever, and more visibly. Her freedom, always excessively limited, was now retrenched. She was transfixed eternally as the old man's prop. Her twenty-first birthday passed, and not a word as to her future, as to a marriage for her, or as to her individuality, desires, hopes. She was papa's cherished darling. Then Mr. Sher caught pneumonia, through devotion to duty, and died in a few days. And at last Lillian felt on her lovely cheek the winds of the world. At last she was free. Of high paternal finance she had never in her life heard one word. In the week following the funeral she learnt that she would be mistress of the furniture, and a little over one hundred pounds net. Mr. Sher had illustrated the ancient maxim that it is easier to make money than to keep it. He had held shipping shares too long, and had sold a fully paid endowment insurance policy in the vain endeavour to replace by adventurous investment that which the sea had swallowed up. And Lillian was helpless. She could do absolutely nothing that was worth money. She could not begin to earn a livelihood. As for relatives, there was only her father's brother, a board school teacher with a large vulgar family and an income far too small to permit of generosities. Lillian was first incredulous, then horror-struck. Leaving the youth of the world to pick up art as best it could without him, and fleeing to join his wife in paradise, the loving, adoring father had in effect abandoned a beautiful, idolised daughter to the alternatives of starvation or prostitution. He had shackled her wrists behind her back and hobbled her feet and bequeathed her to wolves. That was what he had done and what many and many such fathers had done, and still do, to their idolised daughters. Herein was the root of Lillian's awful burning resentments against the whole world, and of her fierce and terrible determination by fair means or foul to make the world pay. Her soul was a horrid furnace, and if by chance Lionel Sher leaned out from the gold bar of heaven and noticed it, the sight must have turned his thoughts towards hell for a pleasant change. She was saved from disaster, from martyrdom, from ignominy, from the unnameable, by the merest fluke. The nurse who tended Lionel Sher's last hours was named Grig. This nurse had cousins in the typewriting business. She had also a very kind heart, a practical mind, and a persuasive manner with cousins. End of Part 1 Chapter 2Part One, Chapter Three of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part One, Chapter Three Advice to the Young Beauty. Come, come now, now, poor girl. You surely aren't crying like this because you've been kept away from your dance tonight. Lillian gave a great start and an oh, and searching hurriedly for a handkerchief inadequate to the damning of torrents, dried up her tears at the source, 
but could not immediately control the sobs that continued to convulse her whole frame. Uh, no, Mr. Grigg, she whimpered feebly. Then she snatched at a sheet of paper and began to insert it into the machine before her, as though about to start some copying. Uh, Miss Grigg is rather unwell, said Felix Grigg. She insisted I should come up, and so I came. With that he tactfully left the room, obeying the wise rule of conduct under which a man conquers a woman's weeping by running away from it. Lillian's face was red. It went still redder. She was tremendously ashamed of being caught blubbering, and by Mr. Grigg. It would not have mattered if one of the girls had surprised her, or even Miss Grigg, but Mr. Grigg. Nor would it have mattered so much if circumstances had made possible any pretence, however absurd and false, that she was not, in fact, crying. But she had been trapped beyond any chance of a face-saving lie. She felt as though she had committed a sexual impropriety, and could never look Mr. Grigg in the eyes again. At the same time she was profoundly relieved that somebody belonging to the office, and especially a man, had arrived to break her awful solitude. So Mr. Grigg knew that she had a dance that night. There was something piquant and discomposing in that. Gertie Jackson must have chattered to Miss Grigg. They were as thick as thieves, those two, or at any rate the good-natured Gertie flattered herself that they were. And Miss Grigg must have told Felix. Very discreetly the girls would refer among themselves to Mr. Grigg as Felix. Brother and sister must have been talking about her and her miserable little dance. Still a dance was a dance and the mere word had a glorious sound. Nobody except herself knew that her dance was in a basement. So he had not come to the office to relieve and reassure her in her unforeseen night watch, but merely to placate his sister. And how casually, lightly, almost quizzically he had spoken! She was naught to him, a girl typist, one among a floating population of girl typists. Miss Grigg had no distinction. Her ankles proved that but Felix was distinguished, in manner, in voice, in everything he did. Felix was a swell, like the easy flaneurs in Bond Street that she saw when she happened to go out of the office during work hours. It was said that he'd been married, and that his wife had divorced him. Lillian surmised that if the truth were known, the wife, more than Felix, had been to blame. All these thoughts were mere foam on the great, darkly heaving thought that Felix had horribly misjudged her. Not his fault, of course, but he had misjudged her. Crying for a lost dance, indeed. She terribly wanted him to be made aware that she was only crying because she had experienced an ordeal to which she ought not to have been exposed, and to which no girl ought to have been exposed. Miss Grigg again. It was Miss Grigg, not Felix, who had sneered at hold-ups. There had been no hold-up, but there might have been a hold-up, and in any case she had passed through the worst sensations of a hold-up. Scandalous! Anxious to be effective, she took up the typing of a novel which had been sent in by one of their principal customers, a literary agency, and tried to tap as prosaically as if the hour were 11.30 a.m. instead of 11.30 p.m. Bravado! She knew that she would have to do the faulty sheet again, but she must impress Felix. Then she heard Felix calling from the principal's room. "'Miss Cher! Miss Cher!' a little impatient as usual. "'Yes, Mr. Grigg?' She rushed to the mirror, and patted herself with a tiny sponge that under Miss Grigg's orders was supposed to be employed for wetting postage stamps, but never was so employed save in Miss Grigg's presence. "'I shall tell him why I was crying,' she said to herself as she crossed the ante-room, "'and I shall tell him straight.' He was seated on the corner of the table in the principal's room, and rolling a cigarette. He had lighted the gas-stove. A very slim man, of medium height, and of no age, he might have been thirty-five, with prematurely grizzled hair, or fifty, with hair younger than the wrinkles round his grey eyes. Miss Grigg had said or implied that she was younger than her brother, but the girls did not accept without reserve all that Miss Grigg might say or imply. He had taken off his overcoat, and now displayed a dinner-jacket and an adorably soft shirt. Lillian had never before seen him in the evening dress, for he did not come to the office at night, and nobody expected him to come to the office at night. He was wonderfully attractive in evening dress, which he carried with the nonchalance of regular custom. So different from her father, who put on ceremonial attire about three times a year, 
and wore it with deplorable self-consciousness, as though it were a suit of armour. Mr. Grigg was indeed a queer person to run a dipe-rotting office. The name was aware that he had been to Winchester and Cambridge, and done all manner of unusual things before he lit on typewriting. "'Any work coming to-night, Miss Shear?' he demanded, in the bland, kindly, careless, official tone which he always employed to the girls, a tone rendering the slightest familiarity impossible. "'Anybody called?' Lillian knew that he was merely affecting an interest in the business, acting the role of a managing proprietor. He had tired of the business long ago, and graciously left all the real power to his sister, who had no mind above typewriting. "'Someone did come in just before you, Mr. Grigg,' Lillian replied, seizing her chance, and in a half-challenging tone she related the adventure with the night watchman. "'It was that that upset me, Mr. Grigg. It might have been a burglar. I made sure it was, and me all alone.' "'Quite, quite,' he stopped her. "'I can perfectly imagine how you must have felt. You haven't got over it yet, even. Sit down. Sit down.' He said no word of apology for his misjudgment of her, but his tone apologised. "'Oh, I'm, I'm perfectly all right now, thank you. Please.' He slipped off the table and pulled round Miss Griggs' chair for her. She obediently sat down, liking to be agreeable to him. He unlocked his own cupboard and brought out a decanter and a liqueur glass. "'Drink this.' "'Please, what is it?' "'Brandy. Poison,' he smiled. She smiled, sipped and coughed as the spirit burned her throat. "'I can't drink any more,' she appealed. "'That's all right, that's all right.' It was his humorous use of the word poison that touched her. This sole word changed their relations. Hitherto they had never for a moment been other than employer and employed. Now there was something else. She was deeply flattered, assuaged, and also excited. Brought up to scorn employment, the hardest task for her in her situation in the Grigg office had been to admit by her deportment that there was a bar of class between her employer and herself. The other girls addressed Mr. Grigg as Sir, but she never. She always called him Mr. Grigg, and nothing could have induced her to say Sir. Now he was protecting her. He had become the attendant male. His protection enveloped her like a soft swan's down quilt, exquisite, delicious. And it was night. The night created romance. Romance suddenly filled the room like a magic vapour, transforming him, herself, and the commonest objects of the room into something ideal. "'Several times I've wanted to speak to you about a certain matter,' said Mr. Grigg quietly, and paused, gazing at the smoke from his cigarette. Uh, "'Oh, yes?' Lillian murmured nervously, and strove to accomplish the demeanour of a young woman of the world. She much regretted that she had her wristlets on. As he was not looking at her, she could look at his face, and she looked at it as though she had never seen it before, or with fresh perceiving eyes. A very clever, rather tired face, superior, even haughty, self-assured, fastidious, dissatisfied, the face of one accustomed to choose sardonically between two evils, impatient, bitter, humorous, with hints of benevolence. She thought, of course he's never spoken to me because of his sister. Even he has to mind his P's and Q's with her. And he's one that hates a fuss. Now she isn't here. She could not conceive what might be the certain matter. She thrilled to learn it. But he would not be hurried. No, he would take his own time, Mr. Grigg would. This was the most brilliant moment of her life. He said, looking straight at her and forcing her to look straight at him, "'You know, you've no business in a place like this, a, a girl like you. "'You're much too highly strung, for one thing. "'You aren't like Miss Jackson, for instance. "'You're simply wasting yourself here. "'Of course, you're terribly independent, but you do try to please. "'I don't mean try to please merely in your work. "'You try to please. It's an instinct with you. "'Now, in typing, you'd never beat Miss Jackson. "'Miss Jackson's only alive, really, when she's typing. "'She types with her whole soul. "'You type well.' I hear, but that's only because you're clever all round. You'd do anything well. You'd milk cows just as well as you type. But your business is marriage, and a good marriage. You're beautiful, and as I say, you have an instinct to please. That's the important thing. 
You'd make a success of marriage because of that, and because you're adaptable and quick at picking up. Most women, when they're married, forget that their job is to adapt themselves and to please. That's their job. They expect to be kowtowed to, and spoilt, and humoured, and to be free to spend money without having to earn it, and to do nothing in return except just exist, and perhaps manage a household pretty badly. They seem to forget that there are two sides to a bargain. It's dashed hard work, pleasing is, sometimes. I know that. But it isn't so hard as earning money, believe me. Now, you wouldn't be like the majority of women. You'd keep your share of the bargain, and handsomely. If you don't marry, and marry fifty miles above you, you'll be very silly. For you to stop here is an outrage against common sense. It's merely monstrous. If I wasn't an old man, I wouldn't tell you this, naturally. Now, you needn't blush. I expect I'm not far off thirty years older than you, and you're young enough to be wise in time. She was blushing tremendously, and in spite of an effort of courage, her gaze dropped from his. At length his gaze shifted on the pretext of dropping cigarette ash very carefully into an ashtray. He had then been thinking about her all these months, differentiating her from the others, summing her up. And how well he had summed her up, and how well he had expressed himself, so romantically, somehow, and yet with such obvious truth. Of course he had been having a dig at his own wife, who had divorced him. You could see how embittered he was on the subject of wives. She wondered if he had thought her beautiful for long. Fancy him moving about the office and forming ideas about all of them, and never a sign, never the slightest sign that he could tell one of them from another. And he had chosen that night to reveal his mind to her. She was inexpressibly flattered, because Mr. Grigg was clearly a connoisseur. She had always felt that. If Mr. Grigg had considered her beautiful... And in fact she had an established assurance of beauty. She knew a good deal about herself. Proudly she reflected, amid her blushes, upon the image of her face and hair, the eyes that matched her hair, the perfectly formed ears, the softness of the chin and the firmness of the nose, the unchallengeable complexion, the dazzling teeth. She was simple enough to be somewhat apologetic about the largeness of her mouth, unaware that a man of experience flees from a small rosebud mouth as from the devil, and that a large mouth is the certain sign of goodwill and understanding in a woman. She was apologetic, too, about the scragginess of her neck, and with better reason, but the wrists and the ankles, the legs, the shoulders, the swelling of the hips, the truly astounding high, firm and abundant bosom, beyond criticism. And she walked beautifully, throwing back her shoulders and so emphasising the line of the waist at the back. She walked with her legs and hips, and the body swam forward above them. She had observed the effect thousands of times in street mirrors. The girls all admitted that she walked uniquely. Then further she had a smile, rarely used, which would intensify in the most extraordinary way the beauty of her face, lighting it, electrifying the eyes, radiating a charm that enraptured. She knew that also. A superlative physical pride rose up out of the subconscious into the conscious, and put her cheap, pretty clothes to shame. It occurred to her that Mr. Grigg had been talking very strangely, very unusually. "'I don't suppose I shall ever marry,' she said plaintively. "'How can I?' She meant, and without doubt he understood, "'how can I possibly meet a man who is worth marrying?' She thought with destructive disdain of every youth who had ever reacted to her charm. The company at the dance she had missed seemed contemptible. They were still dancing. What a collection of tenth-rate fellows! She became gloomy, pessimistic, as she saw the totality of her existence and its prospects. The home at Putney had been a prison. She had escaped from it, but only to enter another prison. She saw no outlet. She was trapped on every side— she could not break out of the infernal circle of poverty and of the conventions. Not in ten years could she save enough to keep her for a year. She had to watch every penny. If she was mad enough to go to a West End theatre, she had to consider the difference between a half-crown and a three-shilling pit. Thousands of men and women negligently fling themselves into expensive taxis. 
but a rise in bus fares or tube fares would seriously unbalance Lillian's budget. She passed most of her spare time in using a needle to set off her beauty, but what a farce was the interminable study and labour. She could not possibly aspire to even the best gloves, and as for the best stockings or the second best, the price of such a pair came to more than she could earn in a week. It was all absurd, tragic, pitiful. She had common sense ample enough to see that her beauty was futile, her ambitions baseless, and her prospects nil. If she had been a vicious girl, she might have broken through the dreadful ring into splendours which she glimpsed and needed. But she was not vicious. Pooh! exclaimed Mr. Grigg impatiently. You can marry anybody you liked if you put your mind to it. And he spoke so scornfully of her lack of faith, so persuasively, so inspiringly, that she had an amazing and beautiful vision of herself worshipped, respected, alluring, seductive, arousing passion, reciprocating passion, kind, benevolent, eternally young, eternally lovely, eternally exercising for the balm and solace of mankind and a man the functions for which she was created and endowed, in a word, fulfilling herself. And for the moment, in the ecstasy of resolution to achieve the impossible, she was superb and magnificent, and the finest thing that a man could ever hope to witness. And she thought desperately, I'm twenty-three already, time is rushing past me. "'Tomorrow I shall be old.' "'After a silence, Mr. Grigg said, "'You're very tired. "'There's no reason why you shouldn't go home to bed.' "'Indeed I shan't go home, Mr. Grigg,' she answered sharply, "'with grateful, eager devotion. "'I shall stay, supposing some work came in. "'It's not twelve o'clock yet.' "'She surprised quite a youthful look on Mr. Grigg's face. "'Nearly thirty years older than herself. "'Ridiculous! "'There was nothing at all in a difference of years.' Some men were never old. Back in the clerk's room she got out her vanity bag and carefully arranged her face. And as she looked in the glass she thought, After tonight I shall never be quite the same girl again. Did he really call me in to ask me about the work? Or did he only do it because he wanted to talk to me? End of Part 1 Chapter 3
and very anxious to meet him as an equal on his own ground of fine manners. She divined that, having entered the room once and fairly caught her asleep, he had had the good taste to withdraw and cough and make a new entry in order to spare her modesty, and she was softly appreciative, while quite determined to demonstrate by her demeanour that she had not been asleep. She thought, Gertie Jackson would have known where to look in my place. Still, despite her disdain of Gertie Jackson's deportment, she felt herself to be terribly unproficient in the social art. "'Is it anything urgent?' she asked. "'Well, it is a bit urgent.' He had a strong, full, pleasant voice. "'Won't you sit down?' "'Thanks.' He sat down, disposing his hat by the side of her machine and his overcoat on another chair, and drawing off his gloves. Lillian waited like a cat to pounce upon the slightest sign of familiarity and kill it for she had understood that men about town regarded girl typists as their quarry and as nothing else. But there was no least lapse from deferential propriety. The clubman might have been in colloquy with his sister's friend, and his sister listening in the next room. He pulled a manuscript from his breast pocket, and after a loving glance at it, offered it to her. "'I have only just written it,' said he, "'and I wanted to take it round to the evening standard office myself in the morning before eight-thirty, the editor's an acquaintance of mine, and I might get it into tomorrow afternoon's paper. In fact, it must be tomorrow or never, because of the financial debate in the house, you see. Topical. I wonder whether you'd be good enough to do it for me. Let me see, said Lillian professionally. About fifteen hundred words, or hardly. Oh, yes, I'll do it myself. That's very kind of you. Will you mind looking at the writing? Do you think you'll be able to make it out? I was at a bit of a jolly tonight, and my hand's never too legible. Without glancing further at the manuscript, Lillian answered, "'It's our business to make out writing.' Suddenly she gave him her full smile. "'I suppose it is,' he said, also smiling. Now, "'Shall I call the copy about eight o'clock?' "'I'm afraid the office won't be open at eight o'clock,' said Lillian. "'We close at six-thirty for an hour or two. "'But what's the address? Is it anywhere near here?' Six uh, 6A German Street. "'You'll see it all on the back of the last page.' It could be delivered, dropped into your letter-box, by six-thirty this morning, and you could take it out of the box any time after that. The idea seemed to have spontaneously presented itself to her. She forbore to say that her intention was to deliver the copy herself on her way home. "'But this is most awfully obliging of you,' he exclaimed. "'Not at all. You see, we specialise in urgent things. We charge double for night work, I ought to tell you. In fact, three shillings a thousand, with a minimum.' "'Of course, of course. I quite understand that. Perhaps you'll put the bill in the envelope.' He drew forth a watch that looked like a gold half-crown. Two o'clock. And I can count on it being in the letter-box at six-thirty?' "'Absolutely.' "'Well, all I say is it's very wonderful.' She smiled again. "'It's just our business.' He bowed gracefully in departing. As soon as he was gone, she looked at the back of the last page. "'Lord Mackworth.' Never having heard of such a lord, she consulted the office who's who. Yes, he was there. Mackworth, Lord, C for Manor, Earl of. She turned to the F pages. He was the E.S. of the Earl of Fer Manor. E.S. meant eldest son, she assumed. One day he would be an earl. She was thrilled. Eagerly she read the manuscript before starting to copy it. The subject was the fall in the exchange value of the French franc. Abstruse she called it to herself, frightfully learned. Yet the article was quite amusing to read. In one or two places it was almost funny enough to make her laugh. And Lord Mackworth illustrated his points by the prices of commodities and pleasure at Monte Carlo. Evidently he had just returned from Monte Carlo. What a figure! He had everything. Title, blood, wealth, style, a splendid presence, perfect manners. He was intellectual, he was clever, he was political, he wrote for the press. And withal, he was a man of pleasure, for he had been to Monte Carlo, and that very night he had taken part in a jolly, whatever a jolly was. No, he was not married. It was impossible that he should be married. But naturally he must keep mistresses. They always kept mistresses. And what a man like him could see in that sort of girl passed Lillian. You could marry anybody you liked, if you put your mind to it, Mr. Grigg had said. Absurdly, horribly untrue. How, for instance, could she set about to marry Lord Mackworth? 
She was forever imprisoned. She could not possibly by any device break through the transparent, invisible, adamantine walls that surrounded her. Beautiful, was she? Gifts, had she? Well, she had sat opposite this lord, close to him, in a room secure from interruption, in the middle of the night. She had been obliging. Had he not been sufficiently interested to swerve by a hair's breadth from his finished and nonchalant formal politeness? Her role in relation to Lord Mackworth was to tap out his clever article on the old Underwood, and to deliver it herself in the chilly darkness of the morning, before going exhausted to her miserable lodging. She lovely, she burning with ambition, the vision of the man of title and of parts was like an act of God to teach her the realities of her situation and the dangerous folly of dreams. She tiptoed out of the room to see if Mr. Grigg really was asleep, as Lord Mackworth had suggested. She hoped that he was unconscious and that the visit was her secret. Either he was very soundly asleep, or the stir of the arrival and departure must have awakened him. If he was awake, she would pretend that she wanted to inform him of the job just come in, since he had previously inquired about the course of business. If not, she would say nothing of the affair, merely enter up the job in the night-book, and wait for any inquiries that might be made before opening her mouth. Through the door ajar, Mr. Grigg could be seen fast asleep in his padded chair. His lower jaw had fallen, revealing a mouth studded with precious metal. He was generally spry in his easy-going manner, and often had quite a youthful air. But now there could be no mistake about his age, which, according to Lillian's standard of age, was advanced. To Lillian, forty was oldish, fifty quite old, and sixty venerable. What a contrast between the fresh, brilliant, authentic youth of Lord Mackworth and the imitation juvenility of Mr. Grieg, even at his priest! The souvenir of Lord Mackworth's physical individuality made the sight of Mr. Grieg almost repellent, she was divided from Mr. Grigg by the greatest difference in the world, the difference between one generation and another. She crept back, resolving to accomplish the finest piece of typescript that had ever been done in the office. Had she not brains to surpass Gertie Jackson at anything if she chose to try? Just as she was entering the, her own room, the outer door of the office opened. More urgent work. It was Lord Mackworth again. She stood stock still in the doorway, her head thrown back and turned towards him, her body nearly within the room. Agitated by a sudden secret anticipation, by a pleasure utterly unhoped for, she gave him a nervous, welcoming, inquiring smile, a smile without reserve, and full of the confidence due to one who had proved at once his reliability and his attractiveness. She had a feeling towards him as towards an old friend. She knew that her face was betraying her joy, but she did not care, because she trusted him and, moreover, it would in any case have been impossible for her to hide her joy. "'There's just one thing,' began Lord Mackworth in a cautious whisper, though previously he had put no restraint on his powerful voice, and paused. "'Will you come in?' she invited him, also in a whisper, and moved quickly from his line of sight. He followed her, and, having entered her room, softly shut the door, which at the previous interview had remained half open. "'Will you sit down?' They both sat down in their original positions. Yes, they were like friends. More, they were like conspirators. Why? What would the next moment disclose? It seemed to her that the next moment must unfold into an unpredictable, beautiful blossom, such as nobody had ever seen. She was intensely excited. She desired ardently that he should ask her to help him in some matter in which she alone could help him. She was a touching, wistful spectacle. All her defences had sunk away. He could not but see that he had made a conquest, that the city of loveliness had fallen into his hands. It just occurred to me, please tell me if I am being indiscreet, that perhaps you wouldn't mind doing me a little service. I, I may oversleep myself in the morning, and, and I can't get at my man now. Would you mind giving me a ring up on the phone about six o'clock? You see, I have the telephone by my bed, and it would be sure to wake me, especially if you tell the operator to keep on ringing. It's very necessary. I should run along to the newspaper office and see the editor personally as soon as he gets there. Otherwise I might be done in. Of course, I, I could sit up the rest of the night. He laughed shortly. Nearly opposite the end of Clifford Street, in Bond Street, was a hosier's shop with the royal arms over the entrance, and half a dozen pairs of rich blue and crimson pyjamas, and nothing else. 
displayed in the window against a chaste background of panelled acacia wood. Lillian saw a phantasm of her client's lordly chamber, with the bed and the telephone by the bed, and the great form of the man himself recumbent and moveless, gloriously and imperfectly covered in a suit of the blue and crimson pyjamas. She heard the telephone bell, ring, 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 pertinaciously. The figure did not stir. Ring, 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 ring. At last the figure stirred, turned over, half sat up, seized the telephone, which, pacified, ceased to ring, and the figure listened. To her voice. It was her voice that was heard in the chamber. The most sharply masculine hallucination that she had ever had, perhaps the only one, it moved her to the point of fright. The whole house might have rocked under her, rocked once and then resumed its firmness. She felt faint, terror-struck, and excruciatingly, inexplicably happy. And she was ashamed. She was shocked by the mystery of herself. Flushing, she bent her face over the desk. "'Perhaps I'd better sit up all night,' Lord Mackworth added apologetically. "'What's your number?' she asked in a low voice, not looking up. Um, "'Regent 1067.' "'Regent 1067,' she repeated the number, even writing it on her notepad. "'You're really awfully kind. I hesitated to suggest it. I do hope you'll forgive me.' She looked up quickly and into his eyes. "'I shall be delighted to give you a ring.' she said, with sweet, smiling eagerness. "'It's no trouble at all. None at all, I assure you.' She was the divine embodiment of the human, and specially feminine, desire to please, to please charmingly, to please completely, to please with the whole force and beauty of her individuality. The poor boy must get a few hours' sleep. A man needed sleep. Sleep was important to him. As for her, the woman's task was to watch and work, and the moment came she would wake the man— the child, who was incapable of waking himself. "'Well, thanks ever so much,' he rose. "'I suppose you don't want a carbon of your article as well?' she suggested. Mm, "'It's an idea,' he agreed. "'You never know. I, I think I will have a carbon.' As he was leaving, he said abruptly, "'Do you know, I, I imagine I've seen you before, somewhere.' "'I don't think so.' She did not quite like this remark of his. It seemed to her to be a commonplace device for prolonging the interview. It shook her faith in his probity. But he insisted, nodding his head. "'Yes, it is. Bond Street. I, I remember you were wearing an exceedingly pretty hat with some yellow flowers in it.' She was dumbfounded, for she did possess a pretty hat with yellow flowers in it. She had done him an injustice. Fancy him noticing her, admiring, remembering. It was incredible.' She must have made a considerable impression on him. She smiled her repentance for having doubted his probity even for a moment. "'You must have a very good memory,' she said, in her gaze an exquisite admission of his rightness. "'No, I have.' They shook hands. In holding out her hand she drew back her body. She had absurdly hoped that he would offer to shake hands, not really expecting him to do so. He departed with unimpeachable correctness and composure. What nice discretion he had shown in not referring earlier to the fact that her face was not unknown to him. Most men would have contrived to work it in at the very beginning of the conversation, but he had actually gone away the first time without mentioning it. Lillian was left in such a state of exultation that she could not immediately start to work. She was ecstatically inspired with a resolution, far transcending all previous yearnings of a similar nature, to fulfil herself to be herself utterly, to bring her gifts to fruition despite all obstacles and all impossibilities. It was not that she desired to please Lord Mackworth, though she passionately desired to please him, nor to achieve luxury and costliness and elegance and a highly refined way of life. These things, however important and electable, were merely the necessary incidentals to the supreme end of exploiting her beauty, charm, and benevolence, so that in an old age she would not have to say, I might have been. End of Part 1 Chapter 4《Part 1 Chapter 5 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1 Chapter 5 The Devotee. It was after she had made some tea and was taking it at her desk without milk 
but with a bun and a half left over from the previous afternoon's orgy of the small-room clerks, that Lillian had the idea of a mighty and scarcely conceivable transgression, crime, depredation. None of the machines in the small room was in quite first-rate order. The machines were good, but they needed adjustment. Miss G, the clerks referred to her as Miss G instead of Miss Grigg, when they were critical of her, which was often, was almost certainly a just woman, but she was mean, especially in the matter of wages, and she would always postpone rather too long the summoning of a mechanic to overhaul the typewriters. Such delay was, of course, disadvantageous to the office, but Miss G was like that. Lillian, munching, inserted two sheets and a new carbon into her machine, and then pulled them out again with a swift swish. Why should she not abstract Miss G's own machine for the high purpose of tidying Lord Mackworth's brilliant article? It was nearly a new one. Miss G was a first-rate typist. She typed all her own letters, and regularly at night even did copying, and she always had the star machine of the office. The one objection to Lillian's nefarious scheme was the fact that Miss G's machine ranked as the Ark of the Covenant, and the rule forbidding the profane to lay hand on it was absolute and awful. This rule was a necessity in the office, where every other machine amounted to an individuality, and was loved or hated and shamelessly intrigued for or against. Lillian knew a little of Miss G's machine, for on its purpose she had the honour of trying it and reinforcing Miss G's favourable judgment upon it, her touch being lighter than Gertie Jackson's, that amiable, tedious hack, and similar to Miss G's touch. Lillian feared lest her own machine might give a slip towards the end of a page, throw a line out of the straight, and spoil the whole page. Miss G's machine was on the small desk beneath the window in the principal's room. Having reflected, she decided to sin. If Mr. Grigg was awake, she would tell him squarely that her own machine was out of gear, that all the clerks' machines were out of gear, and if he still objected, and he might, for he ever feared Miss G, she would bewitch him. She would put his own theory of her powers into practice upon himself. She would be quite unscrupulous, she would stop at nothing. She went forth excited on her raid. He was still asleep. He might waken. If he did, so much the worse. She must risk it. She regarded him with friendly condescension. She had work to do. She had a sense of responsibility, and she was doing the work. He, theoretically in charge of the office, slept, probably after a day chiefly idle, the grey-haired, charming, useless, irresponsible. And were not all men asleep rather absurd? She picked up the heavy machine. One of its india-rubber shoes dropped off, but she left that where it lay. There were plenty to replace it in her room. Soundlessly, she left the sleeper. Triumphant, unscrupulous, reckless, she did not care what might happen. At work on the article, exulting in the smooth excellence of Miss G's machine, she felt strangely happy. She liked Felix to be asleep. She liked the obscure sensation of fatigue at the back of her brain, amid a resting or roistering world. She liked the tension of concentrating on the work, the effort after perfection. The very machine itself, and the sounds of the machine, the feel of the paper, the faint hiss of the gas-stove, were all friendly and helpful. How different were her sensations, then, from her sensations in the pother and racket and friction of the daytime! She forgot that she was beautiful and born to enchant. She was oblivious of both the past and the future. A moral exultation, sweet and gentle, inspired, upheld and exhilarated her. She heard the outer door open. The threatened interruption annoyed her almost to exasperation. It was essential that she should not be interrupted, for she was like a poet in full flow of creation. Footsteps, someone moving hesitatingly to and fro in the ante-room. There was the word inquiries, painted in black on the glass panel of the small room, thrown into relief by the light within the room, and people had not the sense to see it. The public was really extraordinary. Even Lord Mackworth had not at first noticed it. Well, let whoever it might be find his way about unaided by her. She would not budge. If urgent work had arrived, she did not want it, could not do it, and would not have it. Then she caught voices. The visitor had got into the principal's room, and wakened Mr. Grigg. The voices were less audible now, but a conversation seemingly interminable was proceeding in the principal's room. The suspense vexed her, and interfered with the fine execution of her task. She sighed, tapped her foot, 
and made sounds of protest with her tongue against her upper teeth. At length both Mr. Grigg and the visitor emerged into the anteroom, still tirelessly gabbling. The visitor went, banging the outer door. Mr. Grigg came into her room with a manuscript in his hand. For any absorption, she did not look up. "'Here's something wanted for eleven in the morning. It's going to be called for proof of a witness's evidence in a law case. Very urgent. It's pretty long. You'd better get on to it at once. Then one or two of them would be able to finish it between nine and eleven. Lillian accused him in her mind of merely imitating his sister's method of organisation and partition. "'I'm afraid I can't put this aside, Mr. Grigg,' she said gravely, uncompromisingly. "'What is it?' "'It's just come in.' "'I never heard anybody,' Felix snapped. Lillian thought how queer and how unjust it was that she should be prevented by her inferior station from turning on him and bluntly informing him that he'd been asleep instead of managing the office. "'It's an article by Lord Mackworth for tomorrow's evening standard, and it has to be at the standard office by half-past eight, and I've promised to have it delivered at Jermyn Street by six thirty. "'But who's going to deliver it?' "'I am as I go home.' Well, "'But this is urgent, too, and what's more, I've definitely promised it.' Mr. Grigg protested, waving his manuscript somewhat forlornly. "'What length's yours?' "'It's not the length. It has to be done with the greatest care.' "'Well, yes, that's all very well, but—' His attitude of helplessness touched her. She smiled in her serious manner. "'If you'll leave it to me to see to, Mr. Grigg,' she said soothingly, and yet a little superiorly, "'I'll do the best I can. I'll start it, anyhow. And I'll leave an urgent note for Miss Jackson about it. After all, in two hours they ought to be able to do almost anything, and you know how reliable Miss Jackson is. Miss Grigg always relies on her. She held out her hand for the wretched manuscript. Mr. Grigg yielded it up, pretending unwillingness and uneasiness, but in reality much relieved. A quarter of an hour later he returned to her room in overcoat and hat. "'I think I may as well go home now,' said he, yawning enormously. "'I'm a bit anxious about my sister.' "'Nothing else likely to come in, is there? "'You'll be all right, I suppose?' "'Me?' she exclaimed kindly. "'Of course, Mr. Grigg, I should be perfectly all right.' She wondered whether he really was anxious about his sister. At any rate, he had not the stamina to sit up through all the night in the office. But she, Lillian, had. She was delighted to be alone again. She finished Lord Mackworth's article, read it, and re-read it. Not a mistake. She bound it and stitched it. She entered the item in the night-book, she made out the bill, she typed the address on the envelope. Then, before fastening the envelope, she read through everything again. All these things she did with the greatest deliberation and a nicety. At the end she had ample time to make a start on the other work, but she could not, or would not, bring herself to the new task. She was content to write a note for Gertie Jackson, shifting all the responsibility on to Gertie. Gertie would have to fly round and make the others fly round, and if the work was late? What then? Lillian didn't care. Her conscience seemed to have exhausted itself. She sat in a blissful trance. She recalled with satisfaction that she said nothing to Felix about Lord Mackworth having called in person. She rose and wandered about the rooms, savouring the silent solitude. The telephone was in the principal's room. How awkward that might have been if Felix had stayed. But he had not stayed. End of Part 1 Chapter 5 Part 1, Chapter 6 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 6 The Telephone. Hello, hello, who is it? Is that Regent 1067? Yes. Is that Lord Mackworth? "'Speaking. Who is it?' Uh, "'Griggs Typewriting Office. I'm so sorry to wake you up, but you asked us to. It's just past six o'clock.' Oh, "'Thank you very much. Who is it speaking?' "'Griggs Typewriting Office.' "'Yes, but your name? Miss... Uh, Miss... Oh, I see. Share. Share. Uh, Lillian Share. Not Spare. S-H-A-R-E.' "'I've got it. Share. I recognise your voice, Miss Share. Well, it's most extraordinarily good-natured of you. Most.' I can't thank you enough. Excuse me asking your name. I only wanted it so that I could thank you personally. Article finished? It's all finished and ready to be delivered. It'll be dropped into your letter-box in about a quarter of an hour from now. You can rely on that. 
"'Then do you keep messengers hanging about all night for these jobs?' "'I am going to deliver it myself. Then I shall know it is delivered.' "'Do you know, I half suspected all along you meant to do that. You oughtn't really to put yourself to so much trouble. I don't know how to thank you. I don't, really. It's no trouble at all. It's on my way home. You're just going home, then. You must be very tired. Oh, no, I, I sleep in the daytime. Well, I hope you'll have a good day's rest. A laugh. And I hope now I've wakened you, you won't turn over and go to sleep again. Another laugh from the same end. No fear, I'm up now. I beg your pardon. I'm up, out of bed. A laugh from the Clifford Street end. Good-bye, then. Good-bye, and thanks again. By the way, you're putting the bill with it? Oh, yes. And the carbon? Yes. Good-bye. Good-bye, Miss Sher. Lillian hung up the receiver, smiling and she continued to smile as she left the room and went to her own room and took her street things out of the cupboard and put them on. Nothing could have been more banal, more ordinary, and nothing more exquisite and romantic than the telephone conversation. The secret charm of it was inexplicable to her. She saw him standing in the blue and crimson pyjamas by the bedside, a form distinguished and powerful. She revelled in his gratitude. How nice of him to ask her name, so that he might thank her personally. He did not care to thank a nameless employee. He wanted to thank somebody. And now she was somebody to him. Perhaps she had not been well advised to give him her Christian name. The word, however, had come out of itself. Moreover, she liked her Christian name, and she liked nice people to know it. She certainly ought not to have said that about his not turning over and going to sleep again. No, there was something common in it. But he had accepted the freedom in the right spirit, had not taken advantage of it. She extinguished the gas-stove, restored the stolen typewriter, loosed the catch of the outer door, banged the door after her, and descended, holding the foolscap envelope in her shabbily gloved hand. The forsaken solitude of the office was behind her. Outside, an icy mist floated over wet pavements in the first dim, sinister unveiling of the London day. Lillian wore a thick, broad woollen scarf which comforted her neck and bosom, and gave to beholders the absurd illusion that she was snugly enveloped. But the assaulting cold took her in the waist, and she shivered. Her feet began to feel damp immediately. There was the old watchman peeping out of his sentry-box by his glowing brazier. He recognised her quickly enough, and without a movement of the gnarled face held up her matchbox as a sign of the bond between them. How ridiculous to have classed him with burglars! She threw her head back and gave him a proud, bright, and rather condescendingly gracious smile. Along Clifford Street and all down Bond Street, the heaped dustbins stood on the curb waiting for the scavengers. In Piccadilly, several lions horse fans, painted in Oxford and Cambridge blues, trotted sturdily eastwards. One of them was driven by a woman wrapped in a great mackintosh and perched high aloft with a boy beside her. Nothing else moving in the thoroughfare. The Ritz Hotel, formidable fortress of luxury, stood up arrogant like a Florentine palace, hiding all its costly secrets from the scorned mob. Number 6A German Street was just round the corner from St. James's Street, a narrow, seven-storey building of flats, with a front door as impassive and meaningless as the face of a footman. Lillian hesitated a moment, and relinquished her packet into the brass-bordered letter-slit. She heard it fall. She turned away with a jerky gesture. She had not walked ten yards when a frightful lassitude and dejection attacked her with the suddenness of cholera. Scarcely could she command her limbs to move. The ineffable sadness, hopelessness, wretchedness, vanity of existence washed over her and beat her down. Only a very few could be glorious, and she was not and never could be of the few. She was shut out from brightness, no better than a ragamuffin looking into a candy window. She descended into the everlasting lamp-lit night of the tube at Dover Street, where there was no dawn and no sunset, and all the employees and all the meek, preoccupied travellers seemed to be her brothers and sisters in martyrdom. Her train was nearly empty, but the eastbound trains, train after train, were full of pathetic midgets urgently engaged upon the problem of making both ends meet. After Earl's Court, the train ran up an incline into the whitening day. 
conveniently near to which she lodged. The house was one of the heavily porched erections of the fifties and sixties, much fallen in prestige. The dirty kitchen-maid was giving the stone floor of the porch a lick and a promise, so that fortunately the front door stood open. Lillian had the tiny, mean bedroom on the second floor over the hall. In New York it would have been termed a hall bedroom. Nobody except the gawky, frowsy, stupid, good-natured maid had seen her. She shut her door and locked it. The room was colder even than the street. She looked into the mirror, which was so small that she had had to arrange a descending series of nails for it, in order that piece by piece she might inspect the whole of herself. Her face was as pale as a corpse. Undressing and piling half her wardrobe onto the counterpane, she slipped into the narrow bed, ravenous for sleep and oblivion, and drew the clothes right over her head. In an instant she was in a paradise of divine dreams. End of Part 1 Chapter 6Part two, chapter one of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part two, chapter one The Suicide. The next morning Lillian left her lodging at the customary hour of eight fifteen to join one of the hundreds of hastening, struggling, preoccupied processions of workers that converged upon central London. She had slept for ten hours without a break on the previous day risen hungry to a confused and far too farinaceous tea, done some dressmaking by the warmth of an oil-stove, and gone to bed again for another enormous period of heavy slumber. She was well refreshed, her complexion was restored to its marvellous perfectness, and life seemed simpler, more promising, and more agreeably exciting than usual. She had convinced herself that the Irish lord would call at the office in person to pay his bill, the mysterious and yet thoroughly understood code that governs certain human relations would forbid him either to post a cheque or to send his man with the money. Her only fear was that he might already have called. But even if he had already called, he would call and then call again on one good pretext or another until, anyhow, they would meet, and so on, according to the inconsequent logic of daydreams in the everlasting night of the tube. The dreamer had a seat in the train one of the advantages of living near the terminus, but strap-hangers of both sexes swayed in clusters over her and along the whole length of the car, and both the platforms were too densely populated. She could not read. Nobody could read. As the train roared and shook through Down Street Station, she jumped up to fight her way through strap-hangers towards the platform in readiness to descend at Dover Street. On these early trains, carrying serious people, if you sat quiet until the train came to your station, you would assuredly be swept on to the next station. These trains taught you to meet the future halfway. As it happened, the train stopped about a hundred yards short of Dover Street, and would not move on. Seconds and minutes passed, and the stoppage became undeniably a breakdown. The tunnels under the earth from Dover Street back to Hammersmith were full of stopped trains a few hundred yards apart, and every train was full of serious people who positively had to be at a certain place at a certain time. Lillian's mood changed, the mood of the car changed, and of the train, and of all the trains. No one knew anything, no one could do anything. The trains were each a prison. The railway company, by its officials, maintained a masterly silence as to the origin of the vast inconvenience and calamity. Rumours were borne by spontaneous generation— Hitherto one of God's quite minor achievements, was suddenly gifted with divination, and announced that the electricians at the power station in Lotts Road had gone on strike without notice, and every electric train in London had been paralysed. Half an hour elapsed. The prisoners, made desperate by the prospect of the fate which attended them, spoke of revolution and homicide, well aware that they were just as capable of these things as a flock of sheep. Then, as inexplicably as it had stopped, the train started. Two minutes later, Lillian, with some scores of other girls, was running madly through Dover Street in vain pursuit of time lost and vanished. Not a soul had guessed the cause of the disaster, which, according to the evening papers, was due to an old, unhappy man who had wandered unobserved into the tunnel from Dover Street Station, with the ambition to discover for himself what the next world was like. 
this ambition had been gratified. As Lillian, in a state of nervous exhaustion, flew on tired wings up the office stairs, she of course had to compose herself into a semblance of bright virginal freshness for the day's work, conformable with the employer's theory that until he reaches the office the employee has done and suffered nothing whatever. And Miss Grigg was crossing the anteroom at the moment of Lillian's entry. "'You're twenty-five minutes late, Miss Cher,' said Miss Grigg coldly. She looked very ill. "'So sorry, Miss Grigg.' Lillian answered with unprotesting humility, and offered no explanation. Useless to explain, useless to assert innocence and victimization. Excuses founded on the vagaries of trains were unacceptable in that office, as in thousands of offices. Employers refused to take the least interest in trains or other means of conveyance. One of the girls in the room called the Large Room had once told Lillian that, living at Ilford, she would leave home on foggy mornings at six o'clock, in order to be sure of a prompt arrival in Clifford Street at nine o'clock, thus allowing three hours for little more than a dozen miles. But only in the Book of Doomsday was this detail entered to her credit. Miss Grigg, even if she had heard of it, which she had not, would have dismissed it as of no importance. Yet Miss Grigg was a just woman. I'll come into my room, Miss Chair, will you please? said Miss Grigg. Lillian, apprehending she knew not what, thought to herself bitterly that lateness for a delicious shopping appointment, or a heavenly appointment to lunch at the Savoy, or to motor up the river, affairs of true importance, would have been laughed off as negligible, whereas lateness at this filthy office was equivalent to embezzlement. And she resolved anew, and with the most terrible determination, to escape at no matter what risks from the servitude and the famine of sentiment in which she existed. End of Part 2 Chapter 1《Part 2 Chapter 2 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 2 Chapter 2 The Malady. Miss Griggs' Christian name was Isabel. It was somehow secret and never heard in the office. And Felix, if he ever employed it, could only have done so in the sacred privacy of the principal's room. Like her brother, Miss Grigg might have been almost any age, but only the malice of a prison full of women could have seriously asserted her to be older than Felix. Although, by general consent, an authentic virgin, she had not the air of one. Rather full in figure, she was neither desiccated nor stiff, and when she moved her soft body took on flowing curves, so that clever and experienced observers could not resist the inference— almost certainly wrong, that in the historic part of Isabel lay hidden some Sabine episode or sublime folly of self-surrender. She had black hair, streaked with grey, and marvellous, troubled, smouldering black eyes that seemed to yearn and appeal. And yet, in an occasional gesture and tone, she would become masculine. She went wrong in the matter of clothes, aspiring after elegance and missing it through a fundamental lack of distinction— and also through inability to concentrate her effects. Her dresses consisted of ten thousand details held together by no unity of conception. Thin gold chains wandered, apparently purposeless, over her rich form. They would disappear like a railway in a cutting, and then pop out unexpectedly in another part of the lush rolling countryside. The contours of her visible garments gave the impression that the concealed system of underskirts, cash corsets, corsets, lingerie, hose, and suspenders, was of the most complicated, innumerable, and unprecedented variety. And, indeed, she was one of those women who, for the performance of the morning and the evening rites, trebly secure themselves by locks and bolts and blinds from the slightest chance of a chance of the peril of the world's gaze. The purchase of the typewriting business by Felix had changed Miss Griggs' life from top to bottom. It had transformed her from a relic festering against sloth and frustration into the eager devotee of a sane and unassailable cult. The business was her perversity, her passion. It was her mystic husband, fecundating her with vital juices, the spouse to whom she joyously gave long nights of love. Apart from the business, and possibly her brother, she had no real thoughts. The concern as it existed in Lillian's time was her creation— she would sacrifice anything to it, her own health and life, 
even the lives and health of tender girls. Yes, and she would sacrifice her conscience to it. She would cheat for it. The charges for typewriting were high, for she had established a tradition of the highest class work and rates to match. But this did not prevent her from seizing any excuse to inflate the bills. The staff said that her malpractices sufficed every year to pay the rent, and she was never more priestess-like, more lofty and grandiose than when falsifying an account. Lillian found her seated alone in fluent dignity at the great desk. "'Yes, Miss Grigg?' "'May I inquire, asked Miss Grigg, in grave accents not of reproach but of pain, "'why you did not put in an appearance yesterday, Miss Sher?' Uh, "'Well, madam,' Lillian answered with surprise and gentle rebuttal, "'I stayed here all the night before, and I was so tired I slept all day. "'I didn't wake up until it would have been too late to come.' "'But you knew I was unwell, and that I should count on you upper girls to fill my place. "'Or you should have known. "'What if you were tired? You are young and strong.' You could have stood it easily enough, and there was much work to be done. In a crisis we don't think about being tired, we just keep on. And even if you did sleep all day, I suppose it never occurred to you in the evening that someone would be needed to take charge during last night. The least you could have done would have been to run up and see how things were, but no, you didn't even do that. Shall I tell you who did take charge last night? Miss Jackson. She'd been on duty the whole day yesterday. She stayed all night till six o'clock, and she was back again at nine o'clock this morning, twenty-five minutes before you. And when I told her to go back home, she positively refused. She defied me. That's what I call the true spirit, my dear Lillian. Miss Grigg ceased. Only her lustrous, reproachful eyes continued the harangue. She had shown no anger. She had appealed to Miss Sher's best instincts. The address... "'My dear Lillian, caused misgivings in the employee's bosom. "'Lillian knew that it was Felix, and not Miss Grigg, "'who had admitted her to employment, "'and that Miss Grigg had been somewhat opposed to the engagement. "'She also guessed that Miss Grigg objected to her good looks, "'and was always watchful for an occasion "'to illustrate her theory that a girl might be too good-looking. "'And the tone of the words, my dear Lillian, "'had many since appealing sad sweetness.' Miss Grigg had been known to deviate without warning into frightful inclemency, and she always implacably got the last ounce out of her girls. The culprit offered no defence. There was no defence. Assuredly she ought to have run up on the previous evening. Miss Grigg had spoken the truth. The notion of running up had simply not occurred to the preoccupied Lillian. Nevertheless, while saying naught, she kept thinking resentfully. Here I worked over twenty hours on end, and this is my reward, a slating. This is my reward, a nice old slating. With fallen face and drooping lower lip, she moved to leave. She was ready to cry. And there's something else, Miss Sher. Now please don't cry. When Mr. Grigg came up the night before last to tell you that I was unwell, you ought not to have allowed him to stay. You know that he can't stand night work. Men are not like us women. But how could I possibly— Lillian interrupted, quite forgetting the impulse to cry. "'You should have seen that he left again at once. It would have been quite easy, especially for a girl like you. The result is that he's been a wreck ever since. It seems he stayed till four o'clock and after. I tried my best to stop him from coming at all, but he would come. Please, please think over what I've said. Thank you.' Lillian felt all the soft, cruel, unopposable force of Miss Grigg's individuality. She vaguely, and with inimical deference, comprehended the secret of Miss Grigg's success in business. Youth and beauty and charm, qualities so well appreciated by Felix, so rich in promise for Lillian, were absolutely powerless against the armour of Miss Grigg. To Miss Grigg, Lillian was no better than a cross-eyed, flat-bosomed spinster of thirty-nine. Not a bit better, perhaps worse. Miss Grigg actually had the assurance to preach to Lillian the nauseous and unnatural doctrine that men are by right entitled to the protection and self-sacrifice of women. Moreover, Miss Grigg, without knowing it, had convinced Lillian that her ideas concerning Lord Mackworth were the hallucinations of an excessively silly and despicable kind of brain. And even if Lord Mackworth did playfully attempt to continue the divertissement begun in the romantic night, Miss Grigg, by the sureness of her perceptions and the bland pitilessness of her tactics, would undoubtedly counter him once and for all. The two women, so acutely contrasted in age, form, and temperament, 
had this in common, that they secretly and unwillingly respected each other. But the younger was at present no match at all for the elder. And yet Lillian was not cast down, neither by the realisation of her awful silliness and of her lack of the sense of responsibility, nor by her powerlessness, nor by the awaking from the dream of Lord Mackworth. On the contrary, she was quite uplifted and agreeably excited, and her brain was working on lines of which Miss Grigg had absolutely no notion whatever. Miss Grigg, obviously truthful, had said that she had tried to prevent her grubber from coming to the office on the last night but one. Miss Grigg had been ready enough to let Lillian stay till morning without a word. But Felix had told Lillian that he had come to the office to warn her at his sister's urgent request. Why had Felix lied? The answer clearly was that he had had a fancy to chat with Lillian alone, without Lillian suspecting his fancy. And in fact he had chatted with Lillian alone, and to some purpose. The answer was that Felix was genuinely interested in Lillian. Further, Miss Griggs suspected this interest. If Gertie Jackson had happened to be on duty that evening, would Miss Grigg have opposed her brother's coming? She would not. Finally, Miss Grigg herself had confessed, perhaps unthinkingly, that Lillian was not without influential attributes. The phrase, especially for a girl like you, shone in the girl's mind. She went into the small room, which was at the moment empty. The cover had not yet been removed from her own machine, but the other two machines were open, and Millicent's was ammunitioned with paper. Lillian could hear Milly, who shared the small room with herself and Gertie Jackson, dividing work and giving instructions in an important, curt voice to the mere rabble of girls in the large room. To Lillian's practised sense, there was, throughout the office, an atmosphere of nervous disturbance and unease. Mr. Grigg being absent, she felt sure that before the end of the day, probably just about tea-time, the electrical fluid would concentrate itself in one spot and then explode in a tense, violent, bitter, and yet only murmured scene between two of the girls in the large room, unless, of course, she herself and Millicent happened to get across one another. She took off her things and put them in the clothes cupboard. Gertie's hat and jacket were absent, which meant that Gertie was already out somewhere on the firm's business. Millicent's precious boa was present instead of her thick scarf, which meant that Millicent was to meet at night the insufferably pert young man from the new branch of Lloyd's Bank in Bond Street. The pert young man would dine Millicent at the popular café in Piccadilly, where for as little as five shillings two persons might have a small table to themselves, the aphrodisiac of music, and the ingenuous illusion of seeing life with a capital. Now Lillian never connected life with anything less than the Savoy, the Carlton, and the Ritz. Lillian had been born with a sure instinct in these high matters. She looked at the contents of the clothes cupboard and despised them furiously, and in particular Millicent's boa. Anybody could see what that was. It would not deceive even a bank clerk. Not that Lillian possessed any article of attire to surpass the boa in intrinsic worth. She did not. But she felt no envy in regard to the boa, and indeed never envied any girl the tenth-rate, no, nor the second-rate. Her desire was for the best or nothing she would not compromise. The neighbouring shop-windows had effectively educated her because she was capable of self-education. Millicent and Gertie actually preferred the inferior displays of Oxford Street. She gazed in forward insolence at the workroom full of stitching girls on the opposite side of the street. They were toiling as though they had been toiling for hours. Customers had not yet begun to be shown into the elegant apartment on the floor below the workrooms. Customers were probably still sipping tea in bed with a maid to help them, and some of them had certainly never been in a tube in their lives. Yet the work girls, seen broadly across the street, were on the average younger, prettier, daintier, and more graceful than the customers. Why then? Oh, etc. The upper floors of all the surrounding streets were studded with such nests of heads bent over needles. There were scores and scores of those crowded rooms, excruciatingly feminine. Modes et robes, a charming vocation. You were always seeing and touching lovely stuff, laces, feathers, and confections of stuffs. A far more attractive occupation than typewriting, Lillian thought. Sometimes she had dreamt of a change, but not seriously. To work on other women's attire— 
knowing that she could never rise to it herself, would have broken her heart. Quickly she turned away from the window, still uplifted, passionately determined that one day she would enter the most renowned and exclusive arcana in Hanover Square, and not as an employee either. Then, on that day, would she please with the virtuosity of a great pianist playing the piano. Then would she exert charm. Then would she be angelic and divine. And when she departed there should be a murmur of conversation. She smiled her best in anticipation. Her fingers ran smoothingly over her blouse. Gertie Jackson came in and transformed the rehearsed smile into an expression of dissatisfaction and hostility far from divine. The fingers dropped, as it were, guiltily, and Lillian remembered all her grievances and her tragedy. Gertie Jackson's bright, pleasant, clear, drawn face showed some traces of fatigue, but no sign at all of being a martyr to the industrial system or to the despotism of individual employers. She was a tall, well-made girl of twenty-eight, and she held herself rather nicely. She was kindly, cheerful, and of an agreeable temper, as placid as a bowl of milk. She loved her work, regarding it as of real importance, and she seemed to be entirely without ambition. Apparently she would be quite happy to go on altruistically typing for ever and ever, and to be cast into a typist's grave. Lillian's attitude towards her senior colleague was in various respects critical. In the first place the poor thing did not realise that she was growing old, already approaching the precipice of thirty. In the second place, though possessed of a good figure and face, she did nothing with these great gifts. She had no desire to be agreeable. She was agreeable unconsciously, as a bird sings. There was no merit in it. She had no coquetry, and not the slightest inclination for chic. Her clothes were good, and bought in Upper Street, Islington. Her excellent boots gave her away. She was not uninterested in men, but she did not talk about them. She twittered about them. To Lillian she had the soul of an infant— and she was too pure, too ingenuous, too kind, too conscientious. Her nature lacked something fundamental, and Lillian felt, but could not describe what it was, save by saying that she had no kick in either her body or her soul. In the third place there was that terrible absence of ambition. Lillian could not understand contentment, and Gertie's contentment exasperated her. She pitied that Gertie was faultless, and yet she tremendously despised the paragon, occasionally going so far as to think of her as a cat. And now Gertie straightened herself, stuck her chest out bravely, according to habit, and smiled a most friendly greeting. Behind the smile they concealed no resentment against Lillian for having failed to appear on the previous evening, and no moral superiority as a first-class devotee of duty. What lay behind it, and not wholly concealed, was a grave sense of responsibility for the welfare of the business in circumstances difficult and complex. "'Have you seen Miss Grigg?' she asked solemnly. "'Yes,' said Lillian, with a touch of careless defiance. She supposed Gertie to be delicately announcing that Miss G. had been lying in wait for her, Lillian. "'Doesn't she look simply frightfully ill?' Mm, "'She does,' admitted Lillian, who in her egotism had quite forgotten her first impression that morning of Miss G.'s face. "'What is it?' Gertie mentioned the dreadful name of one of those hidden, though not shameful, maladies which afflict only women, but the majority of women. The crude words sounded oddly on Gertie's prim lips. Lillian was duly impressed. She was as if intimidated. At intervals the rumour of a victim of that class of diseases runs whisperingly through assemblages of women, who, on the entrance of a male, hastily change the subject of talk and become falsely bright. Yet every male in the circle of acquaintances will catch the rumour almost instantly. Some wife runs to inform her husband, and the husband informs all his friends. "'Who told you?' Lillian demanded. "'Oh, I've known about it for a long time,' said Gertie, without pride. "'I told Millie just now, before I went out. Everybody will know soon.' Lillian felt a pang of jealousy. "'It means a terrible operation,' Gertie added. "'But she oughtn't to be here.' Lillian exclaimed. No, Gertie agreed with a surprising sternness that somewhat altered Lillian's estimate of her. No, and she isn't going to be here either. Not if I know it. I shall see that she gets back home at lunchtime. 
She's quarrelled already with Mr. Grigg this morning about her coming up. Do you mean at home they quarrelled? Yes, he got so angry that he said if she came, he wouldn't. He was quite right to be angry, of course, but she came all the same. Miss G must have told Gertie all that herself, Lillian reflected. She'd never be as confidential with me. She'd never tell me anything. And she had a queer feeling of inferiority. We must do all we can to help things, said Gertie. Uh, of course, agreed Lillian, suddenly softened, overcome by a rush of sympathy and a strong impulse to behave nobly, beautifully, forgivingly towards Miss G. Nevertheless, though it was Gertie's attitude that had helped to inspire her, she still rather disdained the virtuous senior. Lillian appreciated profoundly, perhaps without being able to put her feeling into words, the heroic madness of Miss G in defying common sense and her brother for the sake of the beloved business. But Gertie saw in Miss G's act nothing but a piece of naughty and sick foolishness. To Lillian, Miss G, in her superficial yearning softness, became almost a terrible figure, a figure to be regarded with awe and to serve as an exemplar. But in contemplating Miss G, Lillian uneasily realised her own precariousness. Miss G was old and plain, save that her eyes had beauty, and yet was fulfilling her great passion and was imposing herself on her environment. Miss G was doing. Lillian could only be. She would always remain at the mercy of someone, and the success which she desired could last probably no longer than her youth and beauty. The transience of the gifts upon which she must depend frightened her but at the same time intensified anew her resolves. She had not a moment to lose, and Gertie, standing there close to her, sweet and reliable and good, in the dull cage amid the daily circumstances of their common slavery, would have understood nothing of Lillian's obscure emotion. End of Part 2 Chapter 2《パート2》Chapter 3 of《Lillian》by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers.《パート2》Chapter 3 Shut. The two girls had not settled to work when the door of the small room was pushed cautiously open and Mr. Grigg came in, as it were by stealth. Milly, prolonging her sweet hour of authority in the large room, had not yet returned to her mates. By a glance and a gesture, Mr. Grigg prevented the girls from any exclamation of surprise. Evidently he was secreting himself from his sister, and he must have entered the office without a sound. He looked older, worn, worried, captious, as though he needed balm and solace and treatment at once firm and infinitely soft. Lillian, who a few minutes earlier had been recalcitrant to Miss Grigg's theory that women must protect men, now felt a desire to protect Mr. Grigg to save him exquisitely from anxieties unsuited to his temperament. He shut the door, and in the intimacy of the room faced the two girls, one so devoted, the other perhaps equally devoted, but whose devotion was outshone by her brilliant beauty. For him both typists were very young, but they were both women, familiar beings whom the crisis had transformed from typists into angels of succour, and he had ceased to be an employer, and become a man who demanded the aid of women, and knew how to rend their hearts. "'Is she in there?' he snapped, with a movement of the head towards the principal's room. "'Yes,' breathed Lillian. "'Yes,' said Gertie. "'Oh, Mr. Grigg, she ought never to have come out in her state.' "'Well, God damn it, of course she oughtn't,' retorted Mr. Grigg. His language, unprecedented in that room, ought to have shocked the respectable girls, but did not in the slightest degree. To judge from their demeanour, they might have been living all their lives in an environment of blasphemous profanity. "'Didn't I do everything I could to keep her at home?' "'Oh, I know you did,' Gertie agreed sympathetically. "'She told me. I made a Hades of a row with her about it in the hope of keeping her in the house, but it was no use. I swore I wouldn't move until she returned. But, of course, I've got to do something. Look here. One of you must go to her and tell her I'm waiting in a taxi downstairs to take her home.' and that you'll stick in it till she gives way, even if they am there all day. That ought to shift her. Till I have arranged for the doctor to be at the house at a quarter to eleven. You'd better go and do it, Miss Jackson. She's more likely to listen to you. Yes, do, Gertie, you go. Lillian seconded the instruction. Then, 
What's the matter, Gertie? What on earth's the matter? The paragon had suddenly blanched, and she seemed to shiver. First sign of acute emotion. First sign of acute emotion that Lydian had ever observed in the placid creature. It's nothing. I'm only... Oh, it's really nothing. And Gertie, who had not taken off her street things, rose resolutely from her chair. She, who a little earlier had seemed quite energetic and fairly fresh after her night's work, now looked genuinely ill. "'You go along,' Mr. Grigg urged her, ruthlessly ignoring the symptoms which had startled Dillian. "'And mind how you do it, there's a good creature. I'll get downstairs first. And he stepped out of the room. The door opening showed tall, thin Millicent returning to her own work. Mr. Grigg pushed past her on tiptoe. As soon as Gertie disappeared on her mission into the principal's room, Lillian told Millicent, not without an air of superiority, as of an under-secretary of state to a common member of Parliament, what was occurring. Millicent, who loved incidents, bit her lips in a kind of cruel pleasure. She had a long, straight, absolutely regular nose, and was born to accomplish the domestic infelicity of some male clerk. She made an excuse to revisit the large room in order to spread the thrilling news. Lillian stood just behind the still-open door of the small room. A long time elapsed. Then the door of the principal's room opened, and Lillian, discreetly peeping, saw the backs of Miss Grigg and Gertie Jackson. They seemed to be supporting each other in their progress towards the outer door. She wondered what the expressions on their faces might be. She had no clue to the tenor of the scene which had ended in Gertie's success, for neither of the pair spoke a word. How had Gertie managed to beat the old fanatic? After a little pause she went to the window and opened it and looked out at the pavement below. The taxi was there. Two foreshortened figures emerged from the building. Mr. Grigg emerged from the taxi. Miss Grigg was induced into the vehicle, and to Lillian's astonishment Gertie followed her. Mr. Grigg entered last. As the taxi swerved away a little outcry of voices drew Lillian's attention to the fact that both windows of the large room were open and full of clusters of heads. The entire office, thanks to that lath, Millicent, was disorganised. Lillian whipped in her own head like lightning. At three o'clock she was summoned to the telephone. Mr. Grigg was speaking from a call office. A Miss Jackson's got influenza, the doctor says, he announced grimly. So she has to stay here. Nice handful for me. You'd better carry on. I'll try to come up later. Miss Grigg said something about some accounts, I don't know. Lillian quite unable to check a feeling of intense, excited happiness, replied with soothing, eager sympathy and allegiance, and went with dignity into the principal's room, now for the moment lawfully at her mercy. The accounts of the establishment were always done by Miss Grigg, and there was evidence on the desk that she had been obdurately at work on bills when Gertie Jackson enticed her away. In the evening, Lillian, after a day's urgent toil at her machine, was sitting in Miss Grigg's chair in the principal's room, at grips with the day-book, the night-book, the ledger, and some bill-forms. Although experiencing some of the sensations of a traveller lost in a forest, of which the trees were numerals, she was saturated with bliss. She had dismissed the rest of the staff at the usual hour, firmly refusing to let anybody remain with her. Almost as a favour, Millicent had been permitted to purchase a night's food for her. Just as the clock of St. George's struck eight, it occurred to her that to allow herself to be found by Mr. Grigg in the occupation of Miss Grigg's place might amount to a grave failure in tact, and hastily, for he might arrive at any moment, she removed all the essential paraphernalia to the small room. She had heard nothing further from Mr. Grigg, who, moreover, had not definitely promised to come, but she was positive that he would come. However late the hour might be, he would come. She would hear the outer door open, she would hear his steps, she would see him, and he would see her, faithfully labouring all alone for him, and eager to take a whole night watch for the second time in a week. For this hour she had made a special toilet, with much attention to her magnificent hair. She looked spick and span and enchanting. Nor was she mistaken. Hardly had she arranged matters in her own room when the outer door did open, and she did hear his steps. The divine moment had arrived. He appeared in the doorway of the room. Rather to her regret, he was not in evening dress. But how could he be? Still, he had a marvellous charm, and his expression was less worried. He was almost too good to be true. She greeted him with a smile that combined sorrow and sympathy and welcome, fidelity and womanly comprehension. The expert assistant, 
and the beautiful young Eve. She was so discomposed by the happiness of realisation that at first she scarcely knew what either of them was saying, and then she seemed to come to herself, and she caught Mr. Wiggs' voice clearly in the middle of a sentence. Uh, with a temperature of a hundred and four. The doctor said it would be madness to send her to Islington. This sort of influenza takes you like this, it appears. I shall have it myself next. And what are you supposed to be doing? Bills are? He looked hard at her, and her eyes dropped before his experienced masculine gaze. She liked him to be wrinkled and grey, to be thirty years older than herself, to be perhaps even depraved. She liked to contrast her innocent freshness with his warm maturity. She liked it that he had not shown the slightest appreciation of her loyalty. He spoke only vaguely of Miss Griggs' condition. It was not a topic meet for discussion between them, and with a few murmured monosyllables she let it drop. "'I do hope you aren't thinking of staying, Mr. Griggs,' she said next. "'I should be perfectly all right by myself, and the bills will occupy me till something comes in.' "'I'm not going to stay, neither are you,' replied Mr. Griggs curtly. "'We'll shut the place up.' Her face fell. "'We'll shut up for to-night.' "'But we're supposed to be always open. "'Supposing some work does come in. "'It always does, no doubt, but we're going to shut up the place at once.' "'There was fatigue in his voice. "'Tears came into Lillian's eyes. "'She had expected him, in answer to her appeal to him to depart, "'to insist on staying with her. "'She had been waiting for heaven to unfold. "'And now he had decided to break the sacred tradition and close the office.' She could not master her tears. "'Don't worry,' he said in tones suddenly charged with tenderness and sympathetic understanding. "'It can't be helped. I know how just how you feel, and don't you imagine I don't. You've been splendid. But I had to promise Isabel I'd shut the office to-night. She's in a very bad state, and I did it to soothe her. You know she hates me to be here at nights. Thinks I'm not strong enough for it.' "'That's not her reason to-night,' said Lillian to herself. I know her reason to-night well enough. But she gave Mr. Grigg a look grateful for his exquisite compassion, which had raised him in her sights to primacy among men. Obediently she let herself be dismissed first, leaving him behind, but in the street she looked up at her window. The words, open day and night, on the blind, were no longer silhouetted against the light within. The tradition was broken. On the way to the Dover Street tube she did not once glance behind her, to see if he was following. End of Part 2 Chapter 3「Part 2 Chapter 4 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Part 2 Chapter 4 The Vizier Late in the afternoon of the following day, Mr. Grigg put his head inside the small room. "'I just come here, Miss Cher, he began, and then, seeing that Millicent was not at her desk, he appeared to decide that he might as well speak with Lillian where she was. He had been away from the office most of the day, and even during his presences had seemingly taken no part in its conduct. Much work had been received, some of it urgent, and Lillian, typing at her best speed, had the air of stopping with reluctance to listen to whatever the useless and wandering man might have to say. He merely said, "'We should close to-night, like last night.' "'Oh, but Mr. Grigg,' Lillian protested, and there was no sign of a tear this time, "'we can't possibly keep on closing. We had one complaint this morning about being closed last night. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to worry you.' "'Now listen to me,' Mr. Grigg protested in his turn petulantly. Nothing worries me more than the idea that people are keeping things from me in order that I shan't be worried. My sister was always doing that. She was incurable, but I'm not going to have it from anyone else. If you hide things, why are you silly enough to let out afterwards that you were hiding them, and why you were hiding them? That's what I can't understand. Sorry, Mr. Grigg. Lillian apologised briefly, and with sham humility, humouring the male in such a manner that he must know he was being humoured. His petulance, it charmed her. It gave him youth, and gave her age and wisdom. He had good excuse for it. Miss Grigaby moved into a nursing home preparatory to an operation, and Gertie was stated to be very ill in his house, and she enjoyed excusing him. It was implicit in every tone of his voice that they were now definitely not on terms of employer and employee. "'That's all right, that's all right,' he said, mollified by her discreet smile. "'But close at six. I'm off.' "'I really don't think we ought to close,' she insisted, 
with firmness in her voice, followed by persuasion in her features, and she brushed back her hair with a gesture of girlishness that could not be ineffective. He hesitated, frowning. She went on, "'If it gets about them at closing night after night, we're bound to lose a lot of customers. I can perfectly well stay here.' "'Yes, and be no use at all to-morrow. I shall be here to-morrow just the same. If other girls can do it, why can't I?' A touch of harshness in the question. "'Oh, Milly!' she exclaimed, neglecting to call Milly Miss Mary Slate, according to the custom by which, in talking to the principals, everybody referred to everybody else as Miss. "'Oh, Milly!' Millicent appeared behind Mr. Grigg at the door, and he nervously made way for her. "'Here's Mr. Grigg wants to close again to-night. I'm sure we really oughtn't to. I've told Mr. Grigg I'll stay, and be here to-morrow too. Don't you agree we mustn't close?' Millicent was flattered by the frank appeal as an equal from one whom she was already with annoyance beginning to regard as a superior. From timidity in Mr. Griggs' presence she looked down her too straight nose, but she nodded affirmatively her narrow head, and as soon as she had recovered from the disturbing novelty of deliberately opposing the policy of an employer, she said to Lillian, "'I'll stay with you if you like. There's plenty to do, goodness knows.' "'You are a dear,' Lillian exclaimed, just as if they had been alone together in the room. "'Oh, well, have it as you like,' Mr. Grigg rasped, and left, defeated. "'Is he vexed?' Minnie demanded after he had gone. "'Of course not. He's very pleased, really, but he has to save his face.' Minnie gave Lillian a scarcely conscious glance of admiration, as a woman better versed than herself in the mysteries of men, and also as a woman of unsuspected courage. And she behaved like an angel through the whole industrious night, so much so that Lillian was nearly ready to admit to an uncharitable, premature misjudgment of the girl. "'And now what are you going to do about keeping open?' inquired Mr. Grigg, with bland, grim triumph, the next afternoon, to the exhausted Lillian and the exhausted Millicent. "'I thought I'd let you have your own way last night, but you can't see any further than your noses, either of you. You're both dead.' "'I can easily stay up another night,' said Lillian, desperately. But Millicent said nothing. "'No doubt,' Mr. Grigg sneered. "'You look as if you could.' "'And supposing you do, what about tomorrow night? "'The whole office is upset, and, of course, people must go and choose just this time to choke us with work.' "'Well, anyhow, we can't close,' Lillian stoutly insisted. "'No,' Mr. Grigg unexpectedly agreed. "'Miss Mary Slate, you know most about the large room. "'You'd better pick two of them out of there, and tell them they must stay and do the best they can by themselves. "'But that won't carry us through. "'I certainly shan't sit up, and I won't have you two sitting up every second night in turn.' "'There's only one thing to do. "'I must engage two new typists at once. "'That's clear. "'We may as well face the situation. "'Where do we get them from?' "'But neither Lillian nor Milly knew just how Miss Grigg "'was in the habit of finding recruits to the staff. "'Each of them had been taken on through private connections. "'Gertie Jackson would probably have known how to proceed, "'but Gertie was down with influenza. "'I'll tell you what I shall do,' said Mr. Grigg at last. "'I'll get an advertisement into tomorrow's Daily Chronicle. "'That ought to do the trick. "'This affair's got to be handled quickly. "'When the applicants come, you'd better deal with them, Miss Shear. "'In my room. I shall be here tomorrow.' "'He spoke scornfully, and would not listen to offers of help "'in the matter of the advertisement. "'He would see to it himself, and wanted no assistance, "'indeed objected to assistance as being merely troublesome. "'The next day was the day of Miss Griggs' operation.' and the apprehension of it maddened this affectionate and cantankerous brother. Millicent left the small room to bestow upon two chosen members of the rabble in the large room the inexpressible glory of missing a night's sleep. On the following morning, when Lillian refreshed, arrived zealously at the office half an hour earlier than usual, she found three aspirants waiting to apply for the vacant posts. The advertisement had been drawn up and printed, a newspaper had been distributed and read, and the applicants, pitifully eager, had already begun to arrive from the ends of London. Sitting in Miss Griggs' chair, Lillian nervously interviewed and examined them. One of the three gave her age as thirty-nine, and produced yellow to testimonials. By ten o'clock twenty-three suitors had come, and Lillian, frightened by her responsibilities, had impulsively engaged a couple, who took off hats and jackets and began to work at once. She had asked Millicent to approve of the final choice, but Millicent, intensely jealous, and no longer comparable to even the lowest rank of angel, curtly declined. "'You're in charge,' Millicent said acidly. "'Don't you try to push it on to me, Miss Lillian Shear.' 
aspirants continued to arrive. Lillian had the clever idea of sticking a notice on the outer door. All situations filled, no typists required. But aspirants continued to enter, and all of them averred positively that they had not seen the notice on the door. Lillian told a junior to paste four sheets of typing paper together, and she described the notice on the big sheet in enormous characters. But aspirants continued to enter, and all of them averred positively that they had not seen the notice on the door. It was dreadful, it was appalling, because Lillian was saying to herself, I may be like them one day. Millicent, on the other hand, disdained the entire procession and seized the agreeable role of dismissing applicants as fast as they came. In the evening, Mr. Grigg appeared. The operation had been a success. Gertie Jackson was, if anything, a little worse, but the doctor anticipated an improvement. Mr. Grigg showed not the least interest in his business. Lillian took the night's duty alone. Thenceforward the office settled gradually into its new grooves, and though there was much less efficiency than under Miss Grigg, there was little friction. Everybody, except Millicent, regarded Lillian as the Grand Vizier, and Millicent's demeanour towards Lillian was by turns fantastically polite and fantastically indifferent. A fortnight passed. The two patients were going on well, and it was stated that there was a possibility of them being sent together to Felixstowe for convalescence. Mr. Grigg's attendance grew more regular, but he did little except keep the books and make out the bills, in which matter he displayed a facility that amazed Lillian, who really was not a bit arithmetical. One day, entering the large room after hours, Lillian saw Millicent typing on a machine not her own. As she passed, she read the words, "'My darling Gertie, I simply can't tell you how glad I was to get your lovely letter.' and it flashed across her that Millicent would relate all the office doings to Gertie, who would relate them to Miss Grigg. He had a spasm of fear, divining that Millicent would misrepresent her. In what phrases had Millicent told that Lillian had sat in Miss Grigg's chair and interviewed applicants for situations? Was it not strange that Gertie had not written to her, Lillian, nor she even thought of writing to Gertie? Too late now for her to write to Gertie. A few days later, Mr. Grigg said to Lillian in the small room, "'You're very crowded here, aren't you?' The two newcomers had been put into the small room, being of a superior sort and not fitted to join the rabble. "'Oh, no,' said Lillian. "'We're quite comfortable, thank you.' "'You don't seem to be very comfortable. It occurs to me it would be better in every way if you brought your machine into my room.' An impulse and an error of judgment on Felix's part. But he was always propitious. "'I should prefer to stay where I am,' Lillian answered, not smiling. What a letter Millicent would have written in order to describe Lillian's promotion to the principal's room. Often, having made a mistake, Felix would persist in it from obstinacy. "'Oh, as you like,' he muttered huffily, instead of recognising by his tone that Lillian was right. But the next moment he repeated, very softly and kindly, "'As you like, it's for you to decide.' He had not once shown the least appreciation of, or gratitude for, Lillian's zeal. On the contrary, he had been in the main querulous and censorious. But she did not mind. She was richly rewarded by a single benevolent inflection of that stirring voice. She seemed to have forgotten that she was born for pleasure, luxury, empire. Work fully satisfied her, but it was work for him. The mere suggestion that she should sit in his room filled her with deep joy. End of part two, chapter four.